pulling up a PDF version of the PowerPoint slides to follow along with our fun and games today. Down at the bottom of the, uh, the left-hand corner of this slide, you'll see a web address that you can put into your iPad, your computer. It is HTTP colon double slash tiny URL, one word, tinyurl.com slash P-R-O-D for productive, P-E-R-S for persistence. So prod purrs. <laughs> it's catchy, isn't it? It's a rather large file, so please be patient as it downloads. Hopefully it'll okay. not take too much time. Can you hear me? Okay. It's very bright. I feel like I'm, I should be in shiny leather pants at a rock concert with the lights. Anyway, so um, hi. So today we're here to talk to you about productive persistence. So welcome um, to that you, we're all very glad that you're here to, to hear about productive persistence today. So this is um, the, our practical theory of student success. Lawrence and I are from the Carnegie Foundation. And um, my name is Jane Muich, and I'm the director of Productive Persistence. And Lawrence is my associate, and he is the associate for improvement science there at the Carnegie Foundation. And before we get started, it's really a team effort, this line of work that we're working on. And we wanted to mention uh, David Yeager, who is a social psychologist at the University of Austin, Texas, who's worked with us a lot on this work. And also Nicole Gray, who may be out there somewhere, but I can't see anyone, um, who is a teacher from Foothill and is also the interim director of our Advancing Teaching, our Professional Development Program at the Carnegie Foundation. You can't hear me, okay. I have this mic. You can hear me perfectly. Maybe I'll pin this to my lip. And then that will make all the difference and do up a button to try and make it stable. We have a couple of interactive features <laughs> here today. We have some, some group activities a little bit later on. But we have an online poll that we're experimenting with. We've tested it outside of this room. We're hoping it works here. But here's the idea. We're going to open up with an online poll. And here's how this works. If you want to text your response, You'd open up your mobile phone like you normally would. And instead of entering in a phone number, you would enter in the number 22333. So it's a five-digit phone number, if you will. And if you agree with the statement above, and Jane's going to read this here in a minute. If you agree with the statement above, then the message of your text to this number would be 530260. If you disagree, 530263, and if you abstain because you took the poll yesterday and you're our groupies, then you would text the number that's there. So also, if you're on a, on a computer, you can also go to the website that's listed there. And then the Morales math is, uh, well, that's a little bit of ego. OK, Jane. So the Carnegie Foundation is located on Stanford campus in Silicon Valley. So we're trying to be very techy here today to demonstrate where we come from. So the question here right now is being a math person is something about you um, that you cannot change. You're either a math person or you're not. And that's that. So do you agree with that statement? Do you disagree with that statement? And yesterday, if you know the answer, you're abstaining. We've got 30 results so far. 32. We're going to give you about a minute. Yeah. Something about you really can't change. that. That seems quieter. Is that better? Okay. Okay. So we have 51 results. Okay. Are you ready? Are you want to show ready. the results? I'm totally okay. ready. So here are the results from this crowd today. Here's our chart. Okay. So 69, oh, 70 going up. Disagree. But when we look around, we're actually not a typical developmental mathematics classroom, are we? 
So those students may think differently about that, and it's absolutely right that disagreeing would be the correct answer, but if we look at a developmental mathematics classroom, well, a survey of developmental math students. After we look at a blank After screen. We, oh, this is going to be a little clunky. No, it'll be fine. Back and forth. Yep. So being a math person, we asked a survey of our incoming Statway students. So Lawrence and I work within the Carnegie's Pathways, their developmental math pathways, the Quantway and the Statway, but we actually work on these non-cognitive factors um, about student success. So being a math person is something you can or cannot change. Um, some people are good at math, other people aren't, and that's just that. Out of that group of 1,000 students, 87% thought, well, being a math person is something that you can't change. You're either a math person or you're not. And only 10% disagreed with that statement. So we found that to be pretty consistent throughout our surveys of uh, developmental math students, right? There's, well, I always say I was a developmental math student for about seven student. Well, I was a student, actually. I went through community college and started in elementary algebra, but that's a different story. But I was a developmental math teacher for 17 years, and if I had a dollar for every time somebody said, oh, I'm not good in math, I'll never be able to do this, I'm not a math person, I could have retired to Tahiti. And we see that by not being a math person and thinking like, well, I'll never be able to do this, students divest effort and um, put effort towards things that they'll be more successful at. So our students are, um, they come to us, and it's not that they're not persistent. So our students often, they keep circling around our math classes and programs, and they're really motivated to do well, but they're kind of what we call unproductively persistent. I would have students, I taught intermediate algebra about 45 times when I applied for a job once and took count. Um, and there were students who would sign up for my class over and over again. Well, Jane, this time it's going to be different. I'm going to do this other thing or this thing. It's going to be different. But we pulled the same group of students that came through our Statway first cohort, 1,000 DevEd students. We saw that 50% of those students started college three years ago. 20% started college over five years ago. Eight started college over 10 years ago. And there's this 2.5 that started college 20 years ago or more. So sometimes you hear people say, oh, well, my students aren't motivated, my students aren't this, but I really believe that all of our students, and I think all of us believe that here, or we wouldn't be here at the Achieving the Dream conference, they're motivated, um, and they really want to persist. They've come there for goals and um, certificates and degrees, but sometimes they don't know how to persist productively. So this is something that we all know, large numbers of students do not complete developmental math. But the one thing about it, there's been a lot of curriculum designs out there. You know, there's innovative curricula, and people are trying a lot of innovative and interesting, fabulous things. But if you can't get the student to show up and engage in the material, they can't actually be successful at that. So it's more than that. It's more than just the curriculum. But what do we call these other things? So as you go around, and I read the program, because I'm involved in this kind of line of work, right, at the Carnegie Foundation, sometimes it's called non-cognitive aspects. Well, is it study skills? Is it motivation and engagement? Is it effective behaviors? Is it grit? People are talking about grit a lot these days. What is it? So we can't even agree what this whole non-cognitive, other sort of stuff is called. And then, what can we do about them? So a lot of people are working in this space trying to figure out what to do about them, and that's what we're here to talk about today. I also want to point out as we go along, we've been doing this research line within the context of developmental math. But these issues um, that we're talking about aren't unique to that space. It's just the space that we have been working on at the Carnegie Foundation. So we've done a lot of the initial development and framework and uh, ideas within that space, research and development. So everybody's out there working very hard to look for the perfect widget, right? How are we going to fix this? We all know it's this humongous problem. In some ways, I've always felt in my math classes, it's a bigger problem 
then that whole idea of, well, oh, you know, I can't do the math is actually centered in these other problems, right? It's not the math. It's these other things. So, you know, we try peer tutors. That seems like a good idea. They'll talk to people who are their peers and feel more comfortable asking questions. They need study skills. They come, they haven't studied for tests before really effectively. How do we help them learn that? Intrusive advising, really help them get on the right path. Well, there's the metacognition. They need to understand their learning better. So there's all kinds of things. They need to ma navigate the college campus. A lot of mandatory orientations going on and make sure they're in the proper class. They gotta be there. Right? It goes on. All kinds of things. Student cohorts, I put those together at my old college. Invest in faculty development, academic counseling, self-regulated learning. I did that on my, with Lawrence at our old campus as well. Acceleration, getting people through faster so they can persist more easily, have less stopping points, and a sense of self-efficacy. If they believe they're going to do well, they'll do well. So all of these things are people are trying, and uh, some people are being successful at it. Um, you know, some not so much success. We put together a, a really successful year-long cohort, but within that I had no idea, even though it was successful, what aspects of it were successful? What was working for whom? And how was it working? And how can I get the part that's not working raising up if I don't even know what individual parts weren't working? So trying to figure out what's working for whom under what conditions in a really targeted evidence-based way is uh, really the grounding of our work in productive persistence at the Carnegie Foundation. So a lot of these things work really well for some people in some settings, but often not working for everyone in that setting and sometimes not working that well at all. So our starting point when we started about two years ago was looking, okay, so the field doesn't agree on what improves student success. People are trying a lot of different things. Um, those things often don't have evidence-based. If we look at MDRC studies um, that looked at, you know, orientation to college classes and different kinds of, you know, student support things to improve these non-cognitive aspects, either programs or particular sort of support initiatives, um, when we look at those, 90% of them don't really show long-term effects, um, either in credit attainment or increased GPA. And that's when looking at them within, you know, a traditional randomized study. So that was kind of negative, but promising ideas exist, right? So there are things out there that seem really promising to help students that we care about in the settings that we care about do better, right? To help them earn degrees and certificates um, and course completion. So one idea is there's lots of research going on, right, out in research land, right? In universities, psychologists are doing these research experiments that have shown efficacy with students, most often in K through 12, or sometimes in four-year settings, but trying to bring that research then to actually help our students, there's like a huge missing chasm in between those, right? So trying to bring that research into practice to actually help the people we care about is really difficult to do, right? There's not a lot of that actually going on out there. And also out in the field, right, especially at a place like this, there's lots of faculty and programs that are doing amazing work that we could all learn from collectively. And also if we like delved into it a little bit more, we could figure out, well, what particular aspects of that program are helping who and under what conditions to then try and spread that to other campuses um, and other classrooms. So looking at that, can these research ideas help our developmental math students and other community college students, can these ideas that are promising out there in the field, can those spread more widely and help our community college students? So that was our challenge when we came together um, to figure out, I remember in our early uh, days, David and I, who were the initial two people on this line of work, we're trying to, it's almost like you're trying to figure out what's happening and pull these balloons down, you know, down to the ground so you can actually work on them. So we wanted to figure out what particular factors, define the factors that actually lead to student success. And when we talk about these factors today, they're not gonna be like 
oh my gosh, I've never thought of that before, but trying to create a framework that we all can work on to improve on our student outcomes using this framework. We wanted to organize the ideas so that they were easily digestible and usable by faculty out in their classrooms and also by researchers. So they needed to be um, what David sometimes called space valid. So they seemed like familiar to you, uh, like things that matter, practitioners and people out there working with students and creating programs, and also with researchers out um, in academia that are working in this space. We wanted to make sure before we got too far down on a particular path, we wanted to make sure at the Carnegie Foundation, um, we're always working on, well, we can't improve what we can't measure. So we wanted to be able to measure these things that we thought were important, make sure they were important, and then be able to measure if we could affect them and improve them. And then a whole idea going on partnering researchers and faculty together to then create interventions that can help our students. And then learning from that which ones work and how they, we can get them to work more reliably across contexts with more people in more classrooms and more settings. So that's what productive persistence is. So what we call this is productive persistence are the tenacity and the good strategies that students need to be successful. So for students to be successful, what that really means is we need students to continue to put forth effort, right? When faced with challenges, they continue to put forth, put forth effort, but when they're putting forth effort, they're doing so using effective strategies. Like my students, like I said, I taught a really long time. And they'd come, and uh, how many math people are out there? Math instructors? Yeah. I'm sure other instructors have these same sorts of experiences. But they come and say, well, I studied for, you know, 20 hours. I studied for four days straight. And then, you know, this turned out not the way that I thought. It's not that they're not, you know, trying, or it's not that they're, you know, not trying to be productive, but they're not actually doing it in a way that's using effective strategies. So here is our scope of work. I'm going to get a little bit of water. So our scope of work, we, oh. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's good that I have a sense of humor about myself, because if I didn't, who knows what would happen. I'd feel bad. OK, so um, we have this theory of practice that we've created, um, which we're going to talk about today. We created practical measures from that. Thank you, Lawrence. And then we created a set of improvable interventions that we're working on and adding to as we continue to work in this particular area. So we're going to first talk about our theory of practice here today. And when I mean theory of practice, sometimes we call it theory of practice, sometimes we call it practical theory. But it's something that makes sense that everybody can work from. So. Within this work, we have this common aim. We want to be able to um, have activities or interventions. We want to make sure that our students are continuing to put forth effort when faced with challenges. And when they do so, they're using effective strategies. And we created a, what's called a driver diagram, which we actually use a lot at the Carnegie Foundation to create a map of uh, uh, you know, a difficult scope of work or a complex scope of work to then sort out parts that you can actually then focus in and work on instead of trying to do this whole community college like success elixir, right? We can focus on individual parts and try and divine an intervention on that specific, specific part and then see how it works. So the first one, based on our earlier poll, it's really important that students see themselves as capable of learning math. Right? If they don't see themselves capable of learning math, they'll divest energy, get discouraged very easily. Right? They just won't be successful. So that, again, I'm just going to repeat myself, but these are obvious to our gut feelings from working in this space a really long time, but then trying to separate them out in ways that we can work on individual ones. So the second, um, which a lot of uh, student success programs or initiatives work you know, from this particular base, that um, students feel socially tied to peers. You want to have an environment where they feel like they belong there, um, have connections to the campus, to the faculty, to other students, and also have a connection to the course. 
students feel that the actual course have, has value. And just in looking in that particular bucket, so each one of these buckets, if you kind of delve into it a little bit more, can mean a lot of different things. Um, relevance to the course could mean the actual content is relevant. It could be relevant within a program of study. So relevance can mean a lot of different things, that it has value to the student. Um, a really important one, that students have the skills and the habits and the know-how to succeed in a college setting. Right? They can navigate the college campus. They have effective study strategies. They can monitor and manage their anxiety if that comes up in a particular setting. So all sorts of those sorts of um, constructs are in that bucket. And then there's a final really important bucket, which in this case we have blacked out because that's not actually what we're here to talk about today. But none of this can actually work if it's not supported by faculty and the institution and they know how to support students strategies and mindsets in these areas. So you might ask, well, okay, well that all seems well and good. We've got these four buckets, but are these things that are really gonna matter for our community college students? So, one of the things that we're gonna talk about as we go through today and we look at some interventions is trying to develop an evidence base for all of these, um, inter uh, these constructs. So we took these and we tried to figure out, well, okay, based on a survey we constructed with developmental math students, did these actually predict student outcomes in a way that was important? So we categorized students as at risk. So based on like whether you think you're a math person or you're not a math person. Do you have high anxiety about math or not? Do you feel like you belong or you don't belong? So um, looking at students at, re at risk, then we can see, like if we just look at this very first one, um, along those four indicators, that if students um, have four of the risk factors, looking at the one on the left, um, that students who come in and they're higher at risk based on those particular factors, score lower on their entry math exam. There's a small um, baseline math uh, questionnaire survey that students take at the very beginning of the Pathways courses. They score lower on that. Uh, if you are higher at risk, you can see that the students coming in failed the mid-course uh, exam at higher rates. Then even moving towards the end of the course, failed at even higher rates based on those four factors and in our initial survey. And then actually students who had the um, lowest risk factors, had zero risk factors, passed the overall course at much higher rates. So this is really a validity. We went through and to say like, okay, these are the things that we think are important. Are they really important and can we prove that they're important? So in looking at this, it's like, okay. These uh, validate the constructs that we are actually thinking that are important. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at each of these individual, what we call primary drivers, one at a time, and try to give you some examples and some data. Uh, but we also want to draw on some of your own expertise and some of the things that you know to be true from your own experiences in the classroom. And so we're gonna go back to our next poll here. Let's see if it loads up. Oh, good. Did it load? Oh. This is, yeah. yeah, we're good. We're good. So it's the same phone number, so to speak, that we used before. So with your cell phone, the number would be 22333. That's where you're sending your text to. And so what we have here is, <clears throat> let me go over to poll everywhere. We're having some technical difficulties. So what Make we're sure. really looking at while he's getting that set up is that, so we want students to feel better about their math abilities, right? How can we change their mindsets about um, believing that they can do well in their math courses or other courses? So what's the best way to do that? And so what we're talking about here today is that there are um, gut feelings on how to do that well. There's interventions, possibly, in some of these areas on how to do that well. And just trying to thinking about, and not all, um, you know, the gut feelings and ideas all turn out the same. So we're really trying to turn, tease out what's working for whom. 
And so we can actually make um, you know, a positive effect with our students in this area. So now we can see all the text. So we have a question here. What do you think is a, a better way to improve students' beliefs about their own abilities with respect to mathematics? And we have three options for you. We want you to pick one that you think is, in your mind, most effective. The first one is to tell students that they're smart, to instill confidence in them. The second one is to tell students that the brain gets smarter when it overcomes challenges. And the third one is to encourage students publicly when they provide correct or very creative answers to problems that you pose to them in class. Three choices. We've already got 53 responses. And we're going to take a look at these in about 30 seconds or so. Which one would you try in your classroom? What do you think will work the best? Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At what point in the course did you That's a do very the good question. Did everyone hear that question? So the survey that we did, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but we're, I'm glad to clear up the air right now, and then we'll just blow past that slide later, that um, the survey that we did, we actually uh, gave on the very first day. So we give it twice. Um, we gave it on the very first day to students just coming in, because you want to really see you know, what people are bringing directly into the class and then how you can change and how what they bring originally into the class, what it predicts, and how you can make movement on it. So it's the first day survey and then a similar one um, on the, uh, like around the fourth week. Yeah. So let's see what the results are here. So it looks like there's about an even split in terms of majority between the second and the third option, telling students that the brain gets smarter when it Overcomes, uh, when it challenges. overcomes challenges, and encouraging students publicly when they provide correct or creative answers to problems that you pose to them in class. And it turns out that our research shows that we have, well, we have evidence from our research that shows that the second one is particularly associated with the kinds of outcomes that we want to see in our developmental math students. So persistence and passing rates are very much related to uh, this particular second option. Right now, I wish I was a Mac person. Oh, I will. I'll take. I'll take care of it. Right. So that second option ends up being something that's got some evidence that's behind evidence it. Evidence base behind it. Right, and that's something that we are working with in in the foundation. Let me come back here, and we can resume. Jane's going to now talk a little bit about uh, the implications of what we mean by some of this uh, when we talk about mindsets. Okay, so what that's really talking about there, so um, instilling in students and helping students believe that if they put forth effort, their brain can grow and they can become better at a particular challenge, in this case mathematics, is really um, what's called a growth mindset. And it stems from Carol Dweck's work and some others that um, the difference between a fixed mindset, which is really back to that original question of like, well, um, I'm not a math person, I just will never be a math person no matter what I do is really a fixed mindset and then the whole idea that I can become better at math or whatever um, with effort and good strategies. And the actual effects of those two things are really startling. They seem kind of, you know, simple. But the whole idea that if you have a fixed mindset, the important thing with that, because your intelligence is fixed, is that you don't get found out, right? So I'm only as smart as I am, and I don't want people to realize that I can't do this here. I won't go to tutoring, because then that'll show that that's something that I won't be able to, you know, that, that I'll get found out that way. As opposed to, well, if you have a growth mindset, then using um, supports is uh, an intelligent thing to do. That's something that a good intel you know, student that is trying to perform better and do well would do. Uh, the response to challenge, you would divest effort. Well, I can't do this, so I'm just going to forget about it and move on to something that I'll be able to do better, as opposed to seeing the challenge as something like, oh, well, this is something that I can actually master if I work harder and, and try and use good strategies. And actually, the grades markedly for this particular uh, construct, both within our pathways we found and in the original research that we used to then divine, design the intervention from, that the grades decreased um, in students that had a fixed mindset and you had an increase in grades if students had a growth mindset. So a perfect example of what we're trying to do in taking these research ideas into practice, so that was done with middle schoolers um, 
a study where students not only uh, finished that particular course, but it had long-lasting effects afterwards. Um, we worked with David Yeager and uh, community college faculty from Valencia Community College to then design a short thing, because interventions need to be done easily within a classroom. So designed a 40-minute intervention where students read like an age-appropriate, written for adults now, article about the brain. And uh, that said, you know, how your brain can improve with effort. And just to make sure that we were on the right track, they also had a, um, an experiment, a control group, that just read about brain facts. Your brain works this way, does that, learning more about the brain. Um, and then trying to see, well, the whole idea, can this actually improve students seeing themselves as having a growth mindset, and can this actually affect outcomes with their grades? So then this is done with community college students. Actually, our original test was at uh, Santa Monica. And as we'd hoped, um, that actually the control group, the people who read the article about the brain facts, they dropped out at a rate of 20%, and actually the students that had the um, intervention, the article about the mindset, then um, dropped out at half that. So the really interesting thing about this, so you had a 51% decrease in people dropping out. It didn't cost anything, right, to do the intervention, and it only took 40 minutes. All right, we're going to look at uh, the next driver, which is do students feel socially tied to their peers, to their faculty, and, and to the course itself? So on the last poll that you just took, uh, many of you, if not most of you, got the quote unquote right answer. So let's see, we're going to do one more. This is the last time we'll do this. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to ask for your best response to this question related to this second driver. What do you think is a better way to promote social belonging in a developmental math classroom? Choice one, tell all the students, I want you to know that you belong here. Reaching out to students and, and communicating that message to them. Option two is to help students understand that questioning their belonging is normal and usually gets better with time. And then the third option is to implement fun and engaging team building exercises in the first week of class. So those are your three options. We'll give you a minute to respond. So we have 52 responses. All right, let's see what we got. So our third option seems to be dominating the landscape here. Implement fun and engaging team building exercises in the first few weeks of the class. It turns out, However. It turns out we have research studies that show that the second option is effective. So helping students to understand that that initial feeling that they have is normal and short-lived, and giving them that information and equipping them with that information is actually key to helping them overcome that and then to, over time, developing that sense of belonging and then to leading to the outcomes that we want them to actually attain. And an, inter an interesting thing about the third one, because you think like there, you have students that, you know, people, they come into the community college with different aspects to them, right? So that some might feel like, oh, this class is completely beneath me, right? I don't want to feel like I'm in this class with those people, you know? And then there's people who are like, oh, well, I'm nervous that I'm here. I might be able to not to do well. You could have me who went to elementary algebra when I was like 17, and I was just like, I don't want to talk to anyone, you know? So it's actually, there's a lot of variability with students out there when they come to community college classes. So sometimes this, the trying to get everybody to feel like they're part of this group in that way is actually kind of difficult. So I want to talk a little bit with you about this notion of belonging, and in particular, what we call belonging uncertainty. So when we crafted this productive persistent survey that students take at the beginning of Quantway and Statway, there are several items on that survey 
that are worded just a little bit differently. There's at least two items related to this particular uh, construct of belonging. One of them is pretty straightforward, one that you would probably expect. You know, do you feel like you belong and you have social ties with your classmates, with your professors? That's pretty straightforward. But there's another one that's emerged from the research field that asks students, how often do you feel uncertain that you belong? How often do you doubt that you belong in this academic setting? And when we looked at the results of several hundred students in the, our first year of the Pathways, and then looked at outcomes, student outcomes in terms of persistence and retention, what we found was that the item that asked students how often do you doubt whether you belong was actually more predictive than just the sort of straightforward question that you would, right. you would expect. Than, than whether you actually felt you didn't belong. So right. the non... Go ahead. Well, because you could say, like, well, I feel like I don't belong here because this class is beneath me, or I should have been at this other play institution. You know, there's like lots of variability within that whole idea of not belonging. But in the, um, in the being uncertain, you could see, well, I'm not sure if this is for me, so I'm not going to put in effort because I'm not quite sure that this is the place where I should be. So this is a really great example of a situation where sometimes our intuition is headed in the right direction, but if we fine tune it just a little bit more, we can get better results. And so looking at some of the data from our own particular surveys, here was the question that we, we literally asked students on this survey. How often, if ever, do you wonder, maybe I don't belong here? How many of you have ever asked that question, by the way? I used to ask it every day of math graduate school, every single day, what am I doing here? So here's what we found. Note, you, can look at, you can look at sort of the, the charts across on the left side, which are never, hardly ever, and sometimes. And, and so on the y-axis, you have dropout rates as percentages. So for example, let's see. Can people see me if I'm over here from in the back? Because I want to point. I, I can't do this. This is hard. So here's the category always. In other words, this is the group of students who say, I'm always asking or doubting whether or not I belong here. For those students, for the black students who responded, I'm always feeling that way, 71% of those students dropped out of the Pathways courses. And for all the other students, non-black students, 40% dropped out. So that's pretty stark. And then also, even if they frequently are thinking that, black students Half of those students dropped out, and roughly half the rate for other students dropped out. So we're seeing some really interesting results here that tell us something about what we might need to do moving forward. So what would a possible intervention look like to try to counteract the effects that take place when students doubt whether or not they belong in an academic setting? And so what we did was we looked at the academic research field, and we found at least one particular study here that I'll talk about really briefly that was conducted in a four-year university setting, so a different context. And basically, they had a control group, a treatment group. For our purposes, we focus on the treatment group, which told first-year students about how these doubts about belonging in college were, one, very common, and two, short-lived. It passed over time. And they did that by uh, engaging uh, upper-class students, juniors and seniors, and having them relay their experiences and how things got better. And it, it, it lasted a short period of time, but things did improve over time. And then these treatment group students were presented with summary statistics about a survey of those upper-class students and what their experiences were. And then they were read quotations from those students about their experiences. And here is a sample quotation that the treatment group was read. So this is from an Asian American male who's a junior at this particular college. So he said, freshman year, even though I met large numbers of people, I didn't have a group of close friends. I had to remind myself that making close friends takes time. Since then, I have met people, some of whom are now just as close as my friends in high school were. So the treatment group is getting that message. 
And here were the results. On the y-axis, you see GPA. On the x-axis, you see grades over time, starting on the left with freshman year grades, ending on the right four years later, so this is longitudinal data, with senior class grades. So the blue, which is about the level where my arm is, is the black control group, black students who were in the control group. In other words, they didn't receive these messages, they didn't see the summary statistics, they didn't get this message. And what you see, of course, is their grades sort of kind of languish in the first couple of years, and if, if they stay enrolled, then it sort of turns around and you see some improvement. But the, the green line, which is what we want to focus on, that is black students who actually received this intervention. And what do you see? Nice, steady growth. You don't see that languishing. languishing. You see that increase over time from freshman to senior year. When I looked at this graph for the first time, the thing that I noticed was that the ending point for the black treatment group, which is right here at green, is basically the same as what? White control group. So for white students who don't go through that same intervention, and black students who do, by the time you get to senior year, that achievement gap has been closed. And then you also see gains for the white treatment group as well, telling us that this intervention holds promise for all students. And so the question becomes, you know, given that this is a relatively short intervention, we see the achievement gap being reduced. We also saw other results around health and well-being. Those measures were also improved. We have to wonder, how can we adapt this to a community college setting and make it work and then scale it up. So very promising. We are going to quickly go through the last two drivers, we'll try to give you a little bit of an idea in the first two about possible interventions, either that we've actually implemented with some success or others that we want to try to adapt down the road. But the same kind of idea applies, for example, to the third primary driver, the third big bucket that we think will drive us to the aim of helping students become more productively persistent. And this third one is that students believe that the course has value. One common way to talk about this is to look at how relevant students see the course. So there's different ways that you can think about relevance, but we need to keep in mind that relevance is not some objective idea that applies across the board. So as a former math instructor of 16 years, I've seen many textbooks where at the end you know, of this very tightly controlled uh, display of the information, you get at the end of the homework section the application problems. Right? And supposedly, I guess, that's supposed to make it more interesting to students. But as soon as you lay one context onto, into the situation, maybe it's relevant to person A and B, but the other 30 people in your class, they don't care about that. So you can't possibly try to appeal to everybody and hit everybody's marks, right? So we have to keep that in mind. We have to keep in mind that it's relevant to a person or to their goals, or it's not. And so how do we get it to become relevant? And what we're finding as we look at the research field is that strategies that get students to generate reasons why something is relevant to them on their own, perhaps through writing exercises, or in other ways, actually can be very effective, at least at two things. One, promoting short-term interest, so catching their interest, and the research tells us that if you can catch student interest, you can engage them, uh, at least at a certain level, and also uh, helping them to generate these kinds of ideas and reasons why it might be relevant to their own life also prom promotes deeper learning and commitment. So there's research out there that, that does this. And I'm sure many of you, because you are so deeply committed to these kinds of things, this, this should resonate with us. I know it does. So again, the question is, what interventions might make a difference over time? The last 
driver has to do with students having the skills, the abilities, the know-how to succeed in college. And one of the more specific ideas around that has to do with dealing with how students, um, or dealing with how students deal with uh, anxiety, whether it's math anxiety as a whole or math test anxiety more specifically, because th those are not the same thing. And we know there's lots of research going on right now about that, that targeted interventions do exist in other settings that are very promising. And again, we want to figure out how do we adapt them. And then Jane, a little bit later, is going to talk about some of the work that we're doing around this particular area. OK, so here are, let's go back up one more. Here's our theory of practice, as we say, on, all on one slide. What we're going to do is pass out a, what we call our driver diagram, which has not only these, but also what we call secondary drivers. So the secondary drivers essentially just break down those big buckets into smaller pieces to try to figure out what direction do we need to go moving forward. And I, I need a copy so I can make sure I'm using the same. Great, thank you. So what you'll see is the five main buckets toward the left, and then each of those is broken out into smaller, what we call secondary drivers. And then on the far right, you'll see a bunch of blank boxes. These are for what we call change ideas. These are specific interventions that we think are related to helping us to achieve our aim. So for this particular exercise, what we'd like you to do is at your table, scan the diagram, and as a group, choose one primary driver, so one of the main five colors that we have here. Actually, do we want to limit this to the first four, Jane? Or do we want yeah. to? First, first four. First four, unless you have fabulous ideas about the faculty. If you've got fabulous what ideas about write. what to do with the faculty. Your professional development faculty. We would love to hear them. Please fill in those boxes. So pick one we of the top four them. colors. Discuss the secondary drivers. We, we'd be interested in knowing, do you think something's missing? And if you do, because you have lots of knowledge, you can give that to us afterward. And then we'd like you to try to suggest some specific in-class practices that you think could create movement, meaning if we could get good at this well, we and make it effective, we would actually get students to be more productively persistent. Right? <laughs> Choose a representative. We might have some sharing out. We will have some sharing out. So we're going to give you a few minutes to do that. Who doesn't have one? Yep. So let's see. We have some that uh, we weren't expecting this fabulously large of a room. So we have some with some of the interventions actually filled in. So if you get one of the. Well, you can over, diagrams that has the interventions, right, try to more. ignore them. It's not exhaustive. So you can, the rest of you don't have these. Right, they don't have these. Oh. But you also have scored because you also have the references. Hi, Bernadine, you look very. The instructions are on the overhead if you need to review them. Testing, one, two, can you hear me? If you can hear me, raise your hand. If you can hear me, raise your hand. And stop talking. If you can hear me, raise your hand and stop talking. If you can hear me, raise your hand and stop talking. It takes longer in a bigger group, doesn't it? All right, what we want to do now is do a quick, just a quick little discussion. So w which table or tables pick the very first yellow driver at the top? A little different order. Uh, which table pick that, if any, that want to share out real quick? Oh, right here at the front. OK, I'm going to give you the microphone. OK. 
Uh, we picked the first one, uh, and actually the first, very first bullet point on the secondary drivers, uh, because it, it seemed like it was a little bit uh, dense and that it needed to be unpacked a little bit more about uh, what all this accurate knowledge and succeeding meant. Um, she teaches English and I teach Spanish, so it, we thought a lot about uh, what needs to be done on the first few days and first week about uh, succeeding in the course um, in math too and making sure that students understand the amount of work that goes into it and the study skills that you're going to need and also talking about the resources that are available on campus because sometimes students don't even know that there is tutoring so making sure that uh, we get that message out um, anything else to add? so in the first week providing really detailed information about how to actually succeed in the course is a particular specific change idea that you might want to try we need to test it, right? Next driver, students believe they are capable of learning math, the orange. What, what group wants to, I saw this hand first, I'm gonna come over here. Students believe they are capable of learning math. Um, to answer this question, we looked at, uh, talked about uh, setting up what I uh, call critical thinking exercises for the student, where instead of just um, in math, trying to sh show a set of procedures to solve every kind of problem that looks a certain way. Give them some, some principles. They'll look at some basic principles and say, here's, here's what this is. And then, uh, and, to let them, and then give them a problem to try and let them know, uh, first off, that it's okay to be wrong. That, in fact, this problem is a little bit harder and you might get it, a lot of you expect to get it wrong. But to give it a try and then um, to allow them the opportunity to try the problem and then go back and give them another opportunity after you tell them a little bit, well, what could have went wrong? And look at that and give them a chance to correct it and, uh, re and check their answer and try to take some of that fear that if you're solving a real problem, there isn't an answer in the back of the book. You're, um, so there, it's going to need to be checked. You're going to have to trust the process a little bit and work it. And, uh, do that kind of exercise with them. So am I understanding that you were looking at the first secondary driver on the orange list? Yeah, no, okay. Orange. See that math isn't just a set of algorithms right. piece? Yeah. Okay. Right. And can you, all, you can all imagine, right, that doing that is not easy. So developing the routines that, that help that can be scalable in many different contexts and classrooms would be something that we'd want to test and gather evidence about. Okay, now, next driver, the blue. Students believe that the course has value. Any group tackle that one? We, I see the first hand, is that where I'm gonna go? So which secondary driver did you tackle and what change idea did you come up with? Um, well, we, we, we talked about that maybe a secondary driver which wasn't on here is uh, potentially the fact that the course assignments don't have meaning to me, and therefore the course doesn't seem to have meaning to me. In particular, we were talking about how the general education courses are something the students always just want to get out of the way to get to their main areas of study. And so that maybe uh, something that um, we've been trying to do at our institution is, is to try to have culminating projects at the end of courses that the students have some control over so that they can actually turn the topic of a research paper into something that's more interest that is in their area so to make it so that the course is actually in some way directly obviously related uh, and the activities in the course related to what they're doing so kind of one more step beyond beyond the course as to the activities in the course don't have meaning and aren't what I want to do so therefore this whole course doesn't have meaning that reminds me of what we talked about earlier around helping students to create that meaning for themselves. Is, so it's very similar to that, yes. And then the last one, uh, students feel socially tied to peers, faculty in the course. Who tackled that and wants to share? Waiting for the hand. <laughs> Marty. Oh, Marty, my former wonderful dean sitting next. Well, yeah, he's gonna, get, he's gonna tackle the, the last one, look at this. All right, we tackled it, we talked about it. So, um, we just, first we discuss, we actually don't make it easy for faculty to do anything, right? We give them, so for our college, we give them in the contract $850 a year for professional development, which is nothing. 
If you want to go to a big uh, conference, that could be $2,000. And so then we put several hoops in front of them. Who do they have to contact to get other money? They have to contact other faculty who say, no, I'm not sharing it with you. They have to contact the foundation who says, no, not yet. Then they have to go to me or the vice, they have to go to vice president, they have to go to deans. We put several hoops up and maybe they have the tenacity to stay with it and then get the funding. And if not, well, then they're gone, right? They don't do it. We're also not clear as a college as to what we expect for professional development. We have some who always do it on their own. We have others who don't. Nobody's tracking it. So we're not clear what, or the faculty aren't clear within their own departments or divisions what they want to tackle. The college isn't clear what they want them to do. So we talked about maybe we should be clear about all of that. Uh, what else? So setting clear expectations for faculty as to, in terms of uh, what would be a good, good event to, to attend, what would be useful, what ties in with your mission, core themes, things like that. And um, Skagit Valley came up with a great idea of set, they're going to plan ahead and meet in early August and set a professional development calendar so everything's on, laid out ahead of time and kind of remove some of those barriers that Marty was talking about from Edmonds Community College that here's ones you can go to and we're going to make it easy so you can get there so that there's not all those hoops and um, challenges in order to attend these, these uh, professional development events. So a calendar and uh, removing the barriers. So what Dean Cavaluzzi here described is what we in the foundation call a systems issue, a systems problem. We have a system of interacting processes that are not working well and so breaking apart that system and trying to figure out how to fix it is actually a key idea that we are pursuing at the foundation as we employ methods from improvement science. So thank you all for your contributions. Um, obviously, there's tons and tons of great ideas, especially at this particular conference. Mm -hmm. And it gives you an idea of just how, just how much practitioners have to offer in this field of work that we're doing. Jane. OK, so just because. Um, Everybody wants to know what to do in this space, so we're going to share what we're doing and how we're developing interventions and other activities. Interventions always sounds like it's a particular sort of thing, but classroom routines, other interventions to try and really make movement in this space. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the practical measures because I already talked about that, but we have this survey that we created. It's 26 questions because it need to be easily implementable in classes that was based on our exhaustive research scan that we did where we developed our practical framework. We made this really great slide last night about how we did this. So we did this literature review. We developed the practical theory. We developed the literature review. We reduced and rewrote the items. We did a cognitive pretesting, meaning we had students read the items and then they tell you what it means without using any of the words so that you can understand what the student thinks that it means to tell whether they really are meaning what you want it to mean, you know, that kind of a thing. And then we made this practical measure. So uh, we give it on the first day and the fourth week um, to students in our pathways um, to try and measure these constructs we're talking about. So we're creating improvable interventions. So meaning like, well, they may not be perfect. We're trying to test them. We're trying to develop warrant in the classrooms to move from like, oh, I felt that worked well or that seemed to go pretty good. Um, and so we developed an initial set of interventions based on our practical theory um, to just get our work started. And we called those starting strong activities. So they're embedded within the curriculum of the class. Um, and we were focused on really, as opposed to adding a success course, we're really focused on things that you can do effectively without using a lot of classroom time, either within the class or within the online out of class platform. And we called those starting strong activities because um, I was from a community college when I, uh, well, when I, before I went to the Carnegie Foundation and in a developmental math classroom and, I, and we were on quarters, Students needed to get, like, oh my gosh, you got to get on the bus. You got to start off really strong, right? And just if you have any time going, like, oh, I'm trying to get situated, I don't have my textbook yet, you know how all those things go. If they didn't have it, you know, completely moving forward well by the third week, they, you know, you just have to like loop around and start over. That didn't give you a lot of, um, like, there wasn't a lot of cushion to um, reset as it went on. So we named it the Starting Strong Activities to get students off to a strong start. 
And there are particular activities within the curriculum. This was our original starting package. And so we had a get to know you activity. Sometimes we do that when we present. But so try and create um, a social cohesion within the class. We had a contract activity for people to set goals to finish the class and also create productive classroom norms. We had that mindset activity, which was really our first research uh, psychological intervention that we included and in working in groups and you know, created relevance by, or at least you know, working on that with students, why study statistics and mathematics, trying to get students to create uh, relevance for themselves within that. And uh, I'm not going to read these all, but the last one is kind of interesting because um, it's a theoretical framework that's one of the few uh, interventions that uh, has been done with community college students and particularly the developmental math students. So included that. So these targeted psychological interventions with that mindset is an initial um, example of. We're doing more of those this year, so we're super excited about that. Um, our mindset intervention that we included in the Statway and the Quantway class was really one of the best predictors of whether students actually finished the course successfully. It predicted how well students did in an initial baseline math test that they took. So students that had a growth mindset, meaning one standard deviation above the mean, um, and then students who had a fixed mindset, which we took as one standard devi deviation below the mean, just testing into the class they did better on the um, initial assessment that they did the math background survey. But then, you know, that's all well and good, but we're really looking for course outcomes. So if we look at the end of term class performance for students that had a fixed mindset, 58%. Um, this is on the end of course assessment. Uh, in the stat way and the quant way, they take common assessments, so all the classes take the same assessments. That students who had a fixed mindset scored 58, which we were taking as passing to be 60. It's a very difficult, um, or challenging is a nicer word, um, uh, statistics conceptual exam at the end. And that students who had a growth mindset um, scored above that. Oops. Did you want to mention the? I don't know, did I? Well, one quick, let's go back to that <laughs> maybe really did, quick maybe because I it's didn't. interesting. This, this, mm -hmm. where were we? Go up one. I'm going there. Yeah. So related to this end of term assessment, this particular assessment was yeah. field tested pretty extensively using uh, methods from psychometrics. And what they did was they, they actually tested the exam with students who had already completed normal college level statistics course. And their average score on that test was, I, I believe, just about the same, 64%. So students who had already finished a college level statistics course previously took this exam, scored 64%. And those in Statway who had a growth mindset were at 65%. Those with a fixed mindset were at 58%. Just to give you some reference about um, how Statway students did compared to other students taking more traditional stat, uh, statistics courses. So some of the super exciting things we're working on in this area, and again, each one has a researcher that's paired with a community college, um, because it's not something that the researcher can do without us. So um, we're working on mindset boosters for students who take that initial mindset um, activity, and either it doesn't work for them that initial time, or as things get more challenging, um, they kind of start to lose that feeling that they have a growth mindset. Working on that, a really interesting, uh, the other two are working on anxiety. So students, a lot of people, you know, like I knew what was going on on that exam before I got there and I just choked, right? So that's a whole book called Choke, which is written by Cyan Belock, who is gonna be speaking at our national forum and there's information in the back but trying to take those anxiety feelings that people have um, and try and, like the threat reappraisal, try and reformat or re, you know, like redirect that information that's making you feel like, oh my gosh, that flight or flight feeling and your, you know, like your adrenaline shoots up and how to rechannel that into something productive. So um, 
Jeremy Jameson, who works in that, is working with Cuyahoga, and Dr. Cyan Bielak is working with Seattle Community College. So we're working on that this year. It's going to be really interesting. One of the aspects of anxiety is that there's lots of different sorts of anxiety. Is it math anxiety, or is it test anxiety? And really separating out what's going on, because what you do about that will, will be different. So another way that we are trying to advance the work of productive persistence is by bringing practice into research, is the phrase that we've coined. And this is basically leveraging the expert knowledge that good, effective instructors already have. And so the way we're doing this in our, what we call our networked improvement community, is by forming smaller groups of faculty interested in this particular line of work. We call them subnetworks. And they are, in this case, employing methodologies from improvement science to try to build out or improve elements of the starting strong package that Jane described earlier. And so when students took the productive persistence survey, there were several items there that were related to their sense of social belonging, as I said before. And so there may, may have been, I think, four or five different items related to that. What we did was, we took those four items and we took scores for those items, combined them together, and then normed them so that their final composite score was somewhere between zero and one. It's a little background. So let me show you this graph. I call this a roller coaster graph. Anyone seen a graph like this before? So let me explain what's going on here. On the y-axis, you have proportion of students withdrawing from the course. And on the x-axis, you have that normed score that goes from 0 to 1. So if they have a low score close to 0 on this composite set of items, then they are uh, lower. It, it's it's um, not, <laughs> not as good. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't sound flashy. Not as good as if they have a higher score closer to 1 after it's right. normed. And so what you see is if you have very low scores on this composite toward the left of the of the graph, 60% of those students end up withdrawing. By the time you get over here to the right side, so higher scores on that composite related to those items, you see much lower percentages of students withdrawing from the course. And you see a general trend moving downward. And, so, the, oh, and the amazing jazz hand moment in all of this is that this is actually, uh, for students in the pathways, is a better predictor whether students uh, withdraw or, you know, withdraw or not than race or ethnicity or math background store. So it's actually the best predictor whether students remain in the class and finish to the end. So we have this great data related to these few items on this construct of belonging. And so what we decided to do in this subnetwork is really focus on this idea of belonging and so creating social ties. I want to give you a quick example of what one set of faculty in our subnetwork did toward this end. They took the group activity that we had put into the Starting Strong package, and they built upon it. So uh, the two faculty, th their names were Sandy D'Souza and Stephanie Vergara. They are at San Jose State. And they, in a document that they wrote to try to described to us what they did and, and how things turned out. They said that early in their semester, the, the faculty, these two people, noticed that some students were, were not being very active in the group roles that they had assigned. So the starting strong activity wasn't quite working, and they wanted to improve upon it. And so what they did was they ran through a series of tests. They collected data. They analyzed that data to figure out what was working and what wasn't. Um, and the main way they did that was by providing role cards to, to, to the students. So you have uh, you know, different roles that students could take, like the recorder, the reporter, the liaison. And rather than just saying, OK, you're the recorder today, they actually just put cards in front of them and said, if you're the recorder today, here are the things you need to be doing. And then if you're the person assessing your fellow students, the facilitator, then here's a rubric for how you would actually do that. And so that was the change that they implemented. And they used tools from what we call improvement science to do this. It's a, a field that allows you to engage in discipline inquiry, data collection analysis. It's a slightly different model than what we're used to. They collected data, and 
here's an example of the data they collected. This is what we call a run chart. Now, let's see, where are we on time? Yeah. We're going to move on. We're going to move forward, but tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., I'm going to shamelessly pitch a session that myself, Stephanie Hironaka, and Nicole Gray will be leading on this idea of improvement science, what it is, what the tools are, what these run charts are, how do you interpret them, uh, how can they help you to continuously improve over time and, and, and live rather than waiting for like the end of the term to do all your data right. analysis. And the, right, and the interesting thing about that at this very data and evidence-based driven uh, conference is that um, as opposed to waiting exactly like Lauren said till the end to figure out, well, did that whole program work? You can actually investigate whether these smaller aspects that you're trying to implement in real time, you know, whether they work and develop an evidence base as you go along as opposed to the end. So if you want to learn more about that, then join us tomorrow morning after you have your breakfast. Did you want the result? Yeah, so I just want to quickly um, share with you what they said happened at the end. This is a quote from their document that they gave us. And they said, overall, the group participation evaluations really help students to be more accountable for their attendance. It encouraged students to be more active in group discussions and gave students a better sense of belonging. The attendance data shows an average attendance of over 90% for the three sections of Statway at SJSU. So using the different sources of data that they had, this was the conclusion that they came up with. And now what we're doing is taking their ideas, packaging them up, in what we call a starter kit for other faculty, and then we're asking other faculty in the network to test those for us to see if we can get it to work in other conditions. So I guess the last um, thing that we're working on is kind of the back to the drawing board. So the effective learning strategies and trying to incorporate those into the classroom, um, in our survey, those weren't predictive, the questions that we had, which makes sense if you think about it because a lot of our students don't really, are they're not quite sure whether they have learning strategies or not. Like, are you studying well? You know, if you're self-reporting whether you're studying well, you're, you know, they often weren't sure. So we're a little bit back to the drawing board on that. And also integrating learning strategies into the uh, classroom, it's really important to try and figure out how to do that in a non-stigmatizing manner for, um, you know, developmental math students. So we're doing a 90-day cycle or inquiry project on that, and um, we'll let you know what we find out. So productive persistence, it's the tenacity and good strategies um, that students need to be successful. And just looking at a little bit of the data before we leave here today, that you know we are really excited about this line of work. It's developing an evidence base for small things that matter within the classroom that you can actually affect change upon in um, non, like not taking a lot of time of the classroom um, in small ways can have great effects. So this is a slide from our uh, Quantway data, actually, that just shows that classes who are able to have higher levels of these particular things that we're talking about today um, have greater um, persistence rates. So really, um, you know, if, you're, if students have a greater mindset, a growth mindset, right, there's 71% chance more. 71% so of those students persist. Um, same for belonging, for interest, right? If you have uh, lower anxiety, of course, then p students are doing well and persisting at higher rates. So these constructs actually matter, you know, that we've put together in this framework with faculty and researchers. They matter on the classroom level, and they also matter on the individual level, as we saw with belonging and with the mindset, that they actually predict course grades and predict uh, students retaining and persisting. And this is a slide just showing that, you know, we're really, we feel encouraged and we're early in this work and it's a complicated, you know, field of work and there's lots of moving parts as you can see from our driver diagram, lots of things to work on and lots of things that matter. But in this first run through, we did our first run through of Statway last year, that we were able to get movement in the directions we had hoped along these constructs that we've done research on and that seem to be the ones that matter from the first day of class to the third week of class, um, you know, students' uh, mindsets about their ability, they uh, be, had more of a growth mindset by the third week, thought the course and the, um, was more relevant to them, went up math anxiety, even though we weren't doing anything specifically in that area, 
of math anxiety. That went down, so that was kind of a bonus. And stereotype threat is an um, interesting one, which we didn't talk about today, but is actually highly predictive of students um, dropping out of the course. Um, that went down as well. And what that really is, I'll let Lawrence, because you did such a nice job yesterday to explain what stereotype is. <laughs> Just curious, how many Put of you have actually spot. heard of stereotype threat before? Mm -hmm. There's a few. Mm -hmm. Here's the basic idea. Um, it's, it's got a rich research tradition that has been conducted by people like Claude Steele and um, another person named Aronson. There's a big group at Stanford who are working on this. But here's the idea. So I'm Latino, right? And I'm going into mathematics. Kind of rare to go into graduate school, right? So I, I arrive at my institution for graduate school. If I feel as though other people stereotype me and expect me to not be as good at math as other people are. If, if that's something that I take on, then it has implications for the, the, the cognitive load that I can take on. It can impede my ability to perform in situations where I need to perform academically. And so they've done this, these kinds of studies in all sorts of settings, academic, non-academic, women, minorities, um, you name it. It's a very common phenomenon. It happens to almost everybody. And it's an, a very, very interesting uh, theory that has played itself out uh, as, as very as important in, in the very field. Very predictive in our developmental math students. Um, and I guess I thought we should leave with the voice of a student. We didn't have a lot of that here today, just a lot of data about students and helping students. But um, we also have these short surveys, because we try and include student voices in these pathways to improve them, improve the curriculum, improve the experience. Um, so this is one. I feel very confident because I dedicate my time to learn concepts thoroughly. I feel that if one person put in the work to really understand the concepts, they can pass. So that person, right, has a growth mindset. I was never a math person, but coming into Statway has completely made a 360 degree turn about how I feel about math, and it's great. So there's still some math ahead to be done, but at least they feel that they can do it, right? Which is the, actually the important part of all. So, yeah. So we have a few minutes left for questions. Um, and so we'd if like you, to If you have that. a question and would like to ask, I'll run over, put on my tennis shoes. Anyone have a question that Jane wants to Try to tackle? Or if, mm -hmm. or if you want to ask, uh, just us. Also, there are handouts in the back for the National Forum, and there's a filled out driver diagram with interventions and references. And there's one other handout about the math pathways, if anybody wants more information on any of that. And Lawrence and I are here to answer yeah, questions. Yeah, it looks like people are heading for the hills. Heading for so the we'll dinner hang out. or the bar. We will hang out. Thanks for coming. Even longer if you buy us a drink. <laughs> Hi. Oh, good. I'm no, glad you thought so. I'm a person developmental uh -huh. teaching, and I'm not in math. Um, Thanks, Bernadine. No, that was really